Hi Sodbusters! Have you considered keeping honeybees? Before you make that leap, or even if you've already gotten started, I have a few points for you to consider. This video is part of a collaboration coordinated by Sage and Stone Homestead of this channel and several others, including Sweetbriar Farm, GWP Homestead, Yogi Hollow Farm, The Heavenly Homestead, and The Old Swedes Farm. Each of these channels is posting a video providing insight for those considering getting livestock, and each channel is going to be discussing a different animal. I encourage you to check out each video. I'll put links in the description to the other channels, and I encourage you to go and subscribe to them. There will also be giveaways, so be sure to watch all the way to the end to see how to be eligible for that. I keep bees primarily in Layen's Horizontal Hives, using natural beekeeping methods. I'll try to be balanced in my advice, but I freely admit to my own biases. This video is mainly for the backyard hobbyist beekeeper, rather than someone getting into beekeeping commercially. I'll talk more about that distinction later. When I started researching honeybees, my plans were adapted over time as I studied and learned. Taking time to study in advance saved me some expense and labor of learning lessons the hard way. So if you're considering getting hives of your own, these are five things I want you to know about keeping honeybees. Beekeeping doesn't have to be hard or expensive. One of the most common questions I've seen asked by people who are considering getting into beekeeping is how much they should expect it to cost. Some of the most common responses I've seen are in the range of $500 to $1,000 per hive. And some cynical responses say if you have to ask the question, you probably shouldn't consider beekeeping. There's also a common perception that beekeeping must involve hard work, that thorough hive inspections must be done every two weeks, and those inspections will involve lifting heavy boxes. Managing a hive is a time-consuming, labor-intensive, an expensive proposition, so the common wisdom says. I don't think that these cost and effort expectations necessarily have to be true. In 1897, George de Layens published Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives, in which he said, beekeeping requires very little work and only a modest investment to get started. Many widespread contemporary beekeeping practices are based on an industrial approach of beekeeping, in which the bees are kept as livestock, with greater consideration for the benefit of the keeper than for the bees. This livestock management approach assumes that you will be purchasing your bees, moving them into your purchased equipment, usually Langstroth boxes, and then feeding and treating your bees on a regular basis. These interventions require greater input and work on the part of the keeper. But this model ignores alternate approaches to beekeeping that are based more on the bees' natural behaviors. Keeping bees has not always been labor intensive. In the book Practical Beekeeping, published in 1835, Nikolai Vitvitsky said, peasant families commonly have 1,000 hives. Tending these takes little effort so the owner can work his fields and attend to other matters. At that time, beekeeping was a much more relaxed and organic process. Even over 200 years, the nature of the bees hasn't really changed much. But we as beekeepers have made the practice more involved. By following more natural beekeeping practices and letting the bees manage themselves, the work involved can be minimized. In my layens hives, I make splits in the spring to minimize swarming, but otherwise don't really need to get into the brood section of the hives for the rest of the year. My other responsibility is to make sure the bees have enough frames for growth and to harvest surplus honey. Honey bees can be obtained for free by catching swarms. And when a keeper relies upon and works with the nature of the local honey bees, then additional management practices like feeding can be minimized or eliminated entirely. Knowledge makes beekeeping easier. I follow multiple beekeeping groups on Facebook, including some that are targeted towards beginning beekeepers. And I see commonality in some of the questions asked by these beginning beekeepers. That commonality is that people are looking for a set of rules of what to do in their hives and when. And while I recognize that it seems simple to just have a checklist of steps to follow, a greater understanding of honeybees in general helps to understand why to do things and provides greater confidence as a beekeeper. A great place to start learning about the nature of bees is from Dr. Tom Seeley's books, The Lives of Bees and Honeybee Democracy. 
Dr. Seeley has spent decades researching honeybees in the wild and provides a lot of insight about the inner workings of a hive. We benefit ourselves and our bees if we take time in advance to understand how a honeybee colony functions, how queens, workers, and drones develop, how the bees deal with dearth periods, and how they overwinter, how swarming works, and the steps bees take from preparing to swarm to finding a new home, and how they naturally react to outside factors like weather. And the more we learn about the bees themselves, the more the bees can teach us how to be better keepers. Not all honeybees are the same. In the U.S., we keep Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. But within that larger genus are several genetic groups, Italian, Carniolian, Russian, etc. Beekeepers are often familiar with these different genetic strains for their productivity or temperament traits. For example, Italian bees tend to be prolific brood producers and can grow a hive quickly. People might choose a certain genetic strain because they tend to be calm or because of expected disease resistance. But I think to choose bees based on productivity or temperament might be to ask the wrong questions. George DeLayen said, We cannot improve beekeeping by going farther and farther away from bees' natural tendencies. Instead, pick the hive model that is best matched to your locale, populate it with local bees, and the results will speak for themselves. We select honeybees based on the traits that will benefit us, but tend to ignore the traits that will help them to thrive at our location. Italian honeybees may be productive, but they originate in southern Europe and are well suited to a southern subtropical climate. This works well for the southern U.S. But to take these bees, often sourced from breeders in the south, and to put them in hives in the northern U.S. will require greater intervention and work on the part of the keeper. The bees' instinctual brood production and winter preparations will be out of sync with the local nectar flow and climate. Better than purchasing bees which are shipped from another climate zone would be to use bees from local breeders that are acclimated to your climate. But be sure to ask these breeders where they get their queens. Many breeders might source their queens from another climate zone entirely, and it's those queens' genetics which will ultimately determine the traits of the colony. Personally, I think that catching local swarms in the spring, especially from feral colonies, is a better option. And this brings up one more distinction, that of feral bees, or those living in the wild, versus cultivated bees. The genetics of a colony from a feral hive may be uncertain, but those colonies, especially those that have lived in the area for several generations, are likely to be well adapted for the climate and the local nectar flow. In addition, while feral honeybees were nearly wiped out by the varroa mite, their populations have almost completely recovered. And because natural selection has been allowed to take place unimpeded by treatments, those bees tend to have better resistance to the varroa mites and the diseases they carry. There's not just one approach to beekeeping. You don't have to follow the crowd. In case you haven't already figured it out, my beekeeping practices are a little different than most beekeepers in the U.S. I use a different type of hive, I feed very little, actually none in most of my hives, and I don't rely on pesticide treatments for mite control. When I started looking into keeping bees, I was originally going down the path of what would be considered conventional beekeeping. But then I discovered and read the book Keeping Bees with a Smile which talks about keeping bees in a way that works with their nature rather than trying to manipulate them in ways that benefit the keeper. Because I was already pursuing and practicing organic gardening methods, working with the natural balance of the soil, the plants, and the organisms around them, this approach made perfect sense to me. I'm not here to tell you that you must keep bees in the same way that I do, but I do want you to know that you have options. When you go shopping for beekeeping equipment, you'll find that, at least in the U.S., the most available type of hive is the Langstroth hive, which is well suited for commercial or industrial beekeeping, but may not be the best choice for the bees or how you wish to keep them. Many beekeeping clubs tend to encourage a homogeneity of beekeeping methods. Beekeeping mentors will likely encourage their mentees to follow the same practices that they do. And this all makes perfect sense. Familiarity is comfortable. But you have the flexibility 
to decide what's right for you. George DeLayens identifies three categories of beekeepers, which are as applicable today as they were in 1897. Professional beekeepers, which is self-explanatory. Amateur beekeepers, who dedicate a lot of time to the bees and are generally more interested in the bees than their products. And sideline beekeepers, for whom keeping bees is just a side interest. For these latter two groups, DeLayens makes the recommendation that vertical hives require more monitoring and more delicate procedures than horizontal hives without yielding better harvests. If you won't be moving hives around for pollination contracts, then having a hive that's designed to fit four on a pallet isn't necessarily beneficial for you. If you don't want to have to lift heavy boxes or store a lot of modular hive box equipment, then a horizontal hive might be a good choice for you. You can opt to use deeper or foundationless frames to let the bees build comb more naturally. You could even go frameless with a top bar, comfort, or warre type of hive. The equipment for these alternate hive types might not be as widely available, but if you're a hobbyist beekeeper, you're probably not looking to buy a large quantity of equipment anyway. And someone who's handy or willing to learn basic carpentry skills can build their own equipment. So before you drop money on hive equipment, I encourage you to research the different types of hives that are available and find the one that seems to work best for you and how you want to keep your bees. Learn some about different beekeeping practices from the natural treatment free end of the spectrum to the commercial industrial end of the spectrum and find a mentor, whether local or distant, whose perspective and goals match your own and remain flexible. There's nothing to say that you can't use different types of hives or change approach as you learn more. Beekeeping is more fascinating and engaging than expected. If you're going to get bees, then you're about to go down a rabbit hole. My original intent for getting bees was just to have some nearby pollinators for the garden. I figured I might have a couple hives, but didn't plan on making a big commitment. Then I started learning about bees and the complexity and organization of the superorganism that is the honeybee colony. The more I learned, the more interested I got. So you are in danger of being like me. The person who, when asked about their hives, will bore other people to death talking about your bees. Maybe you'll start with just one or two hives. Before you know it, you might be sharing fascinating facts about the difference between worker bees, drones, and queens, whether anyone asks you or not. Watching bees at the hive entrance will become an act of meditation for you. You might start wearing t-shirts that say things like, I'm a keeper. Friends might start calling you the bee guy or lady. You'll start to find an unexpected peace when your elbows deep in stinging insects that other people would run from. And even when you're not working in your hives, you'll find yourself wondering what and how the bees are doing. You might go so far down the rabbit hole that you'll start a YouTube channel to share the fascinating facts about honeybees with other people. Who would do that? But seriously, the honeybee colony is truly a fascinating thing. Plan to spend more time than you expect, especially in your first year, as you learn about your bees. Don't stress about making sure you do everything right, because you're certain to learn how to do things better as you go along. Do take some time to learn about bees beforehand so you can approach your beekeeping with confidence. And when you do have your bees, take opportunities just to watch them come and go from the hive and enjoy their purpose-driven peacefulness. If you have another piece of advice that you would give to a new beekeeper, please post that in the comments. As I mentioned in the beginning, there will be a giveaway and I'll give one pound of honey to one commenter. Even if you don't have a piece of advice to share, Go ahead and post in the comments just to let me know that you want some honey. Other channels in the collaboration will also be doing giveaways, so make sure to watch and comment on their videos. And at the end, Sage and Stone Homestead will be doing a grand prize drawing of commenters on all of the videos. Drawings will be held on Sunday, December 18th, 2022. Check out this playlist to see the other videos in the collaboration. They'll have a lot of great information to share. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.